I believe that knowledge is meant to be shared. And, and life is so much easier when we have access to information when we need it, particularly in research. Hello and welcome to Inspiring Open, candid conversations with influential women whose careers and open ethos have pushed the boundaries of what it means to build community and succeed as a collective. I am Betty Kankambwedu, a journalist and women's rights advocate. Join me as I explore the fascinating backstories behind Africa's most tenacious female personalities. Inspiring Open is a podcast series from Wiki Loves Women, a project of Wiki in Africa. Be inspired, be challenged, be bold. Elizabeth Oyangi is our guest today. Her path into the world of intellectual property started when she unexpectedly landed a job with the BBC in London working with the global brands and licensing department. She later came back to Kenya to train to be a lawyer, but still effortlessly gravitated towards IP, specializing in copyright. She is passionate about intellectual property's intersection with traditional knowledge, culture, and technology. She is currently the copyright specialist at Aga Khan University Global East Africa, where she oversees the university's copyright matters, intellectual property training, and consultation. She is also a certified patent agent. Let's delve right into the conversation. On this podcast, we like to start from the very beginning. Can you tell us about your background? And by background, I mean your childhood, where you grew up, and the kind of upbringing you had. I grew up, we were, we are still, um, we're five children. Um, growing up was very interesting. So I was born and raised in Nairobi. I uh, had a great childhood. My mom was a teacher and my father was a diplomat. So during the holiday, she would pack all five of us and we'd just, we'd go visit him wherever he was. Um, it was good most of the time. Um, dad would not be there, uh, would not be around. So he'd take maybe uh, two holidays a year and he'd either come or we'd go see him. But uh, apart from that, it was great. We went to uh, good school um, and um, I enjoyed it. I had a very good childhood, I have to say. What values were you taught as a child that you still hold on to? Definitely honesty. My father hated lies. So he is a very calm person and he would, um, because he had military training, he would know how to extract truth. And once he discovered that you're telling a lie, he would break your heart into pieces. So honesty was something that we were taught um, from a, a very, very young age, and it's still something I hold dearly. I cannot stand liars, and I cannot stand lying. So um, I think this is one of the most important attributes anyone can have, um, honesty, and then um, loyalty as well honesty really like ties with your profession then because I'm sure when a, cli- <laughs> when a client comes to you you want the truth like you don't want any um, lies anyway so even though you don't necessarily practice law in your current uh, role you are a trained lawyer right yes uh, yes professionally qualified as an advocate of the high court of Kenya um, so, uh, yes, for the last four years, five years, I have been qualified, yes. Did you always want to be a lawyer? Um, so, of course, being young, I mean, careers change, career aspirations change. So, initially, I wanted to be um, an air hostess because I wanted to just travel. Uh, I felt like the roles that air hostesses do is just so awesome because we get to see the world and that was my aspiration until I reached about 16. Um, so in school, I immediately dropped all the sciences because I just loved reading. Um, I loved English literature. So um, based on that, the only other career that I could do uh, where there was a good amount of reading um, would have to be law. And so essentially, I was allowed to pick my own course and and based on what I did for my A-levels, that course just led me to law. How would you describe being a lawyer in, in Kenya as a woman? Hmm, I don't know if, if a, a woman lawyer is the word for it, but I don't know. I believe people get drawn to you um, for the strength of your services. 
And, you know, what goes around uh, if you're an effective performer. And so whether you're a woman or a man, it, it should just be based on the kind of service you provide. Although um, I acknowledge that we still live in a patriarchal society, uh, so both in politics and business. So most people, particularly here in Kenya, would think if they have a case, they'll probably look for a male uh, lawyer first before going to a woman. But for the most part, the work that I've done uh, actually has been referred to me by other women. Um, I've actually never had work referred to me by a man. So I guess, in a sense, being a woman lawyer in Kenya depends on women to send you to send you work and your network as well. So if you do end up building your network to include uh, both, then um, depending on your network, then you get that kind of work um, sent to you. You worked with the BBC. Tell me how you ended up there and what that experience was like. <laughs> it's very interesting. So I graduated uh, from my master's in law in 2008. And that was just like smack in the middle of the Great Recession. Um, and here I was sending out CVs and I'm watching the news and just senior executives being fired. Um, people just leaving offices with boxes. Uh, so when the banks collapsed, so I didn't really expect much when I was applying. In fact, I didn't hear back from many, but I just applied anyway. Um, at the time, we had our one-year-old daughter, uh, Malena. Um, so I just said, you know what, I'm just going to do this. So I set myself out to aim very high. Um, I made countless applications. Um, I got 15 interviews. Um, so by the time I was going for the 16th one, I was like, that's it. I'm done. I mean, this is not going to be, this is not going to happen. Uh, I'm just going to go back to Kenya. But the same day that I went for that 16th interview, they called me back the same day and they offered me the job. <laughs> so that's how I got my first break. Um, and that's how I landed at the BBC offices in London. And at the time I was working at the children's civil brands and licensing department. So this actually shaped my career because they were dealing a lot with licensing of the assets of programs um, and also issues to do with intellectual property. And so that's how I got my start um, in, in the area of IP. I, I was with them for about one and a half years. And then I came back only because I wanted to now pursue my uh, qualifications as an advocate. So I came back to do the training in Kenya. Tell me about how the transition was like coming back from the UK and trying to get your feet back into the law profession in Kenya. Was that a smooth transition? So when I came back in uh, 2012, you needed to, to apply to get the advocate training um, program at the Kenya School of Law. You needed to have 16 mandatory core units, so 16 mandatory modules that you'll have done at university within your degree uh, for you to qualify to get into, into Kenya School of Law. So when I came back, um, they sent a letter. After applying, they sent a letter telling me I was missing four. And it turned out later that there were actually a group of us. There were a group of people who had been denied entry uh, into that course because they had done their degree abroad. And they came back and they were missing a couple, one or two or, or even six uh, modules. So when I came back, um, it was challenging. Uh, because I felt like that was the end, like that's it. I'm never gonna, you know, go in. How am I gonna do these extra, um, uh, extra units? Um, and I remember I went around to at least four universities trying to ask them to plead, please, can you just offer us these extra courses? And they were like, no, we don't, we don't offer um, external courses. Um, we only offer full degrees, like the full three years. And finally, I went to this one university um, called uh, Riara. And um, I just pleaded my case with one, one, one um, professor there, I think he was called Eric. Um, and I told him, you know, this is the situation. Um, is there a way you can offer at least some of these missing modules? And, and lo and behold, um, they agreed. And so that's how me and like 25 other students who had been locked out uh, got in to, to fill in the missing unit. So that, that took about three months. Um, but then after that, um, we were like, yes, so finally we have all our units. Yes, now we can finally go and train and be lawyers. So we go and we drop these applications and Kenya School of Law comes back with another letter. And they're like, um, actually, you need to now go back and you need to equate your qualifications. So your qualifications in the UK, do they equate to the Kenyan ones? 
So I'm like, okay, this is another challenge. So we went to NEC, which is the exam board, and we showed them the letter and we're like, can you equate for us um, our, our, our degrees and our education? So um, whatever we did for A-levels, because it was GCSE, and equated to the Kenyan equivalent. And, and NEC was like, uh, no, we don't do this. We've not done this since 2009. So we're like, now what happened? Because NEC doesn't do this. And Kenya School of Law needs this. I mean, it felt like they were just trying to block. Um, they were just trying to block as many people from getting into the course. So I think at that point, I felt this is it. My career in law is finished. Um, I need to think about what to do now. Um, but the following month, surprisingly, I don't know what happened between then. Um, but they did allow us now to, to be able to get in um, with the extra units that we've done. So that was a challenge. Um, it tested me. I wasn't so sure I'd be, I'd be doing law. But sometimes one institution can hold the power. It can hold the power to your career. No matter what you do, um, there will always be this block. It's similar here in Ghana. There's always this rift between students who want to get into the Ghana Law School and the General Legal Council. And you can tell the grip the General Legal Council has on legal education. It's almost as if it's a cult. Oh, yes, for sure. I mean, uh, the number of complaints that come out of, of, of the law school um, is that there, there used to, before the exam used to be done by the, the law school, now they've been passed on to the Council of Legal Education. But before that, there were complaints that, you know, they fail people purposely um, because when you receipt, then you have to pay more. And so after receipting and you pay to receipt, um, you pass. So, it, it, I mean, there were always these questions about, you know, how how they want to block certain people or a certain number every year um, from, from passing. So I guess that's just, I guess that's just Africa. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So the BBC introduced you to this world of intellectual property and licensing and all that. How did things unfold from there? So, yes. So coming back to Kenya, I knew that even after doing the training as an advocate, I wanted to specialize in the area of intellectual property. So I went and I, I looked around for um, maybe law firms specializing in it, and I couldn't find um, any specific um, law firm dealing with that area. So I ended up at a university that had a research center for intellectual property and technology. And I approached that professor and I, you know, I made a passionate plea and I ended up doing um, a stint at that center. Um, and so that was actually very eye opener. The, the professor there was a chemist, um, and he used to specialize in, in patents. Um, he was very good at, at, at patent work. So after doing, um, that stint, um, I knew for sure that I'd be, I'd be, I'd be doing IP and particularly focused in, in, in patents at the time. And that's how, that's how I've, I've resolved to continue really. Now you work with Aga Khan University as a copyright specialist. How did you land that job too? So it was a game of chance, really. So in 2016, I did this course called Copyright X. Um, it was a course that was offered online at the time by Harvard Law School. So I did that course. And then shortly after finishing that course, um, I hadn't had a chance to apply to any law firm uh, because um, I was still trying to find an opportunity in IP. I saw the advertisement for that in the newspaper and I was like, oh, wow, it's like this job is built for me because here I am. I've just done my copyright X course, got my certificate, and now this job is looking for someone to do copyright. Um, so that's how I ended up with, with Aga Khan University. It's just like, I don't know, maybe it was destiny. Um, I never did intend to go into, into a law firm. Um, after working in that research center, I loved working in academia. So I wanted a position that would allow me not only to do research, but also to to teach, and and that is what I do in my in my present role here at Edekan. Can you delve a bit deeper into your role as a copyright specialist? At the moment, I manage the copyright office, um, which sits in the office of the university librarian, and so the copyright office caters to all our uh, global jurisdictions in East Africa. So we have a campus in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda another campus in Pakistan, and, um, uh, and in London as well. So what we do is we train and consult on copyright matters. We run workshops, um, both on copyright, on predatory journals, and publishing practices. 
We offer document clearances and requests for permissions of use. We train on intellectual property. Uh, and most recently, we have just started uh, last month running the Copyright um, X AKU course in conjunction with the Harvard Law School. So, I mean, I just love teaching anything to do with IT, and I, I feel like I'm, I am where I am meant to be. That's, I think that's good to know. I mean, if you are where you're meant to be, I mean, what it means is that you only give your best, and it doesn't even become like a job. And it becomes something you enjoy every single day. Now, Liz, take us into the world of intellectual property, explaining in simplest form what that is. Mm, yeah, so both, generally when we are trying to um, teach IT, we have to break it into three. So my speciality now is only copyright. So copyright is an area of IT that deals with creative work. So anything that's written, painted, drawn, recorded comes under copyright. Then there's the area of patents, which is more on the invention. So anything that is invented within science or technology, um, patents are granted. It's like a certificate that's granted by the government and it can only last for 20 years. So in as much as I'm passionate about patents, that's not what I do now. What I majorly do now is, is on copyrights. Um, although I have the skills, I have been trained um, by most of the world intellectual property, the WIPO courses on patent and patent drafting. Um, majority of my work right now is only focused on, on the copyright aspect. And I feel I should mention, although I said that I don't do legal work, like so at the moment, I'm actually need to with legal work. So the legal, the legal office, uh, officer, she went on maternity leave. So I'm sort of covering uh, the legal office at the moment. Um, I can never seem to run away from law. Um, it always seems to find me. So I, I am covering the, the commercial aspect uh, of, of law for the university at the moment, which is enjoyable. I enjoy law. I mean, it's great, great research. Uh, but my, my foot is largely in the, in the copyright space of, of IP. Do you find a lot of women in the IP industry in Kenya, for instance? In Kenya, women in the IP field, um, we are not that many. When you go now into into the specialized areas like copyright, um, no, we are not that many. When you go now further into IP and go into the patent field, um, no, um, we are not. Um, so in terms of IP, I'm not sure most. Most women, I think, in law prefer to do the other areas of law. Um, maybe the commercial law, it's more um, lucrative, maybe. it's more There's more work there. But when you look at IP in, in Kenya, um, you don't find uh, that many women. Um, I know a handful uh, of women doing um, IP, but um, I can't say uh, one who just specializes in copyright or one who just specializes in patents. Um, so maybe maybe there's a need for advocacy, particularly for women who are doing law. Um, and, and there are so many opportunities now that are coming up in, in terms of IP. So when we look at artificial intelligence um, and things like technology, these are, these are areas that are very much IP-based. So I think there's, there's a need um, for advocacy for girls, more girls, uh, more women, um, to get into IP just because, uh, no, Technology is the future, and and, and IP yeah, IP law is a very um, a very good core to to those aspects as well. Um, I don't think the people who get into IP um, get in just by fluke. I think they were exposed to IP in one form or another. So maybe they were working in the entertainment industry and they saw some gaps. Or they were working with artists or, or music and, and they just saw some gaps in the law and, and that led them to IP. So uh, I think opportunity leads people into this field and also exposure. So if you work in an organization and you see issues to do with IP, then you tend to want to um, work in that field. So opportunity and exposure definitely uh, are factors that might lead people into this field. But I don't think any lawyer who's just come out of law school will be thinking IP is for me if they've never done any IP work and they've never been exposed to it. Let's talk about the open movement now and specifically Creative Commons. When did you come to know about Creative Commons? Yeah, I've been involved with um, Creative Commons since 
uh, around 2013 when I was at the Center um, for IP at the university. So yes, I, I did know about them um, from around 2013. Um, at the time, they were the public lead. Uh, the system of CC has changed now, but at the time, there were two leads. So there was a legal lead, which was uh, a law institution, and then there was a public lead, which could be any other organization. So that university was the public lead, and that professor allowed me to take over the advocacy matters for the university in terms of, of CC staff. So I was speaking at conferences, um, about the, the various licenses and how people could benefit from using openly licensed works and accessing uh, works that others have published with, with the licenses. Um, I believe that knowledge is meant to be shared and, and life is so much easier when we have access to information when we need it, particularly in research. So my office does a lot of clearances and permissions and we see a lot of limitations for work. So some works require you to subscribe, so you pay a fee before you can access it. Um, and there are some authors who publish and then come back to try and use the work later, but then they find out that they can't actually use the work. They have to go back to the publisher and request for permission. So, so definitely the area of open access is important. Um, when we do our copyright training, it's one of the aspects we always touch on um, to ensure everyone understands the benefits of open access publishing not only for the institution, but also for them as the people who own those works. Um, this has benefited us in Aga Khan University. So we have an institutional repository called eCommons, and we, public, we just upload documents. As soon as you see the license is a Creative Commons license, we don't have to worry about going now to the publisher to ask for permissions, and we don't have to worry about copyright infringement. We just upload the documents as per the licensing conditions. So um, definitely, um, open access is, is very much at the core of what we do uh, at the Copyright Office. Where in your career have you found, say, support and how has that been helpful? Mm, yeah, so I remember when I was first starting out, the first thing I Googled was women in intellectual property. So there, I think there was a publication at the time that used to highlight the 50, the top 50 or the 100 uh, women in IP, but those women were based in, in countries like the US and, and Europe, so n nothing in Africa. So I, I, no, I just looked at what do these women do and why are they in this list and how can I get on this, on this list? So your mentors just become the people that you read in the magazine, but you never actually talk to. And then another thing that I found helpful was to attend conferences. So there are a lot of um, virtual conferences um, going on um, to do with IP, and uh, I just attend those. And, and um, after those sessions, then you network. Um, networking builds, builds your circle of people in the industry. Um, so also there are various opportunities with Creative Commons to, to network. They've had uh, conferences in, in different countries. Um, for the past couple of years before COVID. And those conferences were amazing um, because you meet like-minded people, um, particularly those who also work in the, field, in the field of IP. What part of your work do you find most rewarding and what parts do you find complicated? Mm. So the most rewarding part of my job is the teaching. So um, I, I like teaching. I like I like sharing. I think in in things to do with with protection of property and um, knowing when to use somebody else's work, knowing when to get protection. These are very interesting areas for me, and these are things that I get to do constantly. So for me, the teaching aspect is is definitely um, a bonus. Uh, the most challenging, hmm, I think finding the time to, to do research. I think the last time I wrote a paper was in 2018. Um, I'm not so proud about it, but I wish I had, I had more time to, to actually publish more. Um, so the challenging time, the challenging thing is, is, is to find, um, the time to do effective research and to publish more, more, more information in that area. How is the copyright department at Aga Khan different today from when you joined? When I first came in, there was so much, um, there was so much contact, so much requests, emails, requests for training, requests for workshops, requests for can I use this? Why can't I use this? 
But since having uh, this position, we've done so much advocacy that we don't hear as much. So we don't get requests. Um, everything is uploaded on our website. So whenever people need resources, um, they know where to find information. So I'd like to think we've done enough in terms of making people aware of how copyright works. Uh, we've done um, an intellectual property bootcamp uh, just to sort of um, teach people about certain aspects of IP. And uh, that was not just for AKU, that was also open to the public. So I'd like to think there's more knowledge uh, internally with regards to copyright and some aspects of intellectual property. Um, because you see, yeah, you see the results um, based on the data that we get in terms of the work that we do during the year. The contact has been less, which is a good sign because people now sort of know how copyright works and where to get that information. You have a little one, and I'm curious, how do you find a fair balance between being a mother and the responsibilities that come with it and the work you do such that no area is lacking? Mm, mm, interesting question. <laughs> so <laughs> over the last year, we had a, a, a son, um, and so that's been very interesting, um, that, that especially uh, during the pandemic. Um, luckily for us, we were able to uh, do majority well, some days remotely. So managing managing a, a young family and work at the same time it takes it takes a lot. But I believe I have a very good support network. My husband is very hands on, so we have been able to um, do it um, based on our schedules. So I can I can say so far so good. What experiences have really like inspired you to keep going no matter what? Um, I think it's always that thing of wanting to always know more and wanting to, wanting to always keep up. And I'm very aware now that right now there are young people in, in, in school, there are young people in, in colleges and universities, and, and they're coming, and they're coming hard. So you have to be updated. Um, you have to be updated with uh, the current areas. So things like coding, um, this is, these are the trends now. This is what the young people are doing. And if you're just sitting there in your comfort zone, these people will come and they will, they will take over. Yeah. So my, my motivation is the youth. The youth are coming um, and we should be able to do what they do and even better um, because the ways of working are changing, uh, careers are changing. Uh, and so I think the young people really, they really keep me on my feet and I, I want to be able to understand what they understand. Um, I think we used to say um, the people who sit in government offices, uh, we used to laugh, in fact, that they, they can't use computers. Uh, they, can, they cannot use, they don't know what email is. And this is us now. We are now the old ones and the kids are looking at us and, come, and, they're, and they're coming. So, you know, we have to be prepared. We always have to read, keep updated with the trends. And so that, you know, we remain relevant, even if the kids are coming with all all their knowledge and all their coding, uh, we, we need to be prepared. So I'm always trying to learn. Learning is never ending. I'm always trying to learn all these things as well because I, I think it's going to be relevant and it's useful now. That's true. And have you ever hit rock bottom? And how did you pick yourself back up? Yeah, funny you should mention that. So my first year at university was really tough. So I'm a you know, I've left my continent. Uh, I'm in a new place. I'm all alone. I don't have family. It's just you and you're supposed to be there for three years. So I went through some mind-boggling stuff. I was actually severely depressed uh, those first two years. Um, and I had to take time out of school because it was just affecting my performance. Um, I can safely say that I pulled through that episode because uh, by that time I had met my now husband. And he was there. Um, he was there. Family was there. I used to be on the phone almost every day um, talking to my brothers and just trying to get that support. And when I was finally ready to come back, uh, I did I did my final year. So there is this gap in my education that I don't like to bring up because those are really dark times. But that episode, I really appreciate it. It made me really strong. And my husband knows I don't cry, uh, rarely, because I feel like I walked on molten lava. Um, and I just toughened up as a person. And, um, you know, people take it lightly. Um, things to do with the mind, uh, this is, these are not things that you take lightly. Um, people go through things. And I am, I am very aware now, especially in this society, when people say that they're depressed, it's kind of brushed off. 
Um, nobody really knows how to deal with it. And then you just find people um, deal with it the wrong way. Um, so, yeah, I did. I did hit rock bottom. But that is how, um, I guess, um, I've, I've toughened up. And that's, that's how I rose. <laughs> Yeah, and it's all it's always such a great story, you know. When because we're gonna fall, we will definitely mm. fall, you know, at any mm. point in our lives. But we should always find a reason to get back up. And I'm glad, you know, you you were able to get back up, and now you have the life that you have now. How are you inspiring the next generation of IP professionals, especially girls? Hmm. Okay. Um, I'd like to think I'm inspiring. I'm not sure that I'm doing enough advocacy about it at the moment. So for now at the corporate office, there's one, um, one lady who works with me um, called Esther. Um, I'd like to think that I do enough to inspire her. I'm always challenging her to think far and think outside the box. Um, in terms of the future, yes, I would definitely like to do more work in terms of um, advocacy for IP, particularly for young girls in school. So this is maybe something that I need to put on my bucket list um, starting starting this year. Is there anything you would do differently in your life when you look back? Um, yeah, well, I think maybe straight after high school, I might have taken one year um, or two years um, to work before going to school. I think I'll have been more mature and more grounded, um, particularly with the independence part. But apart from that, I mean, life is a whirlwind and those experiences shape you. I wouldn't change. There have been some very good parts. There have been some quite messy parts. But I'm, I'm glad because, I mean, those are learning experiences and that's, that's what builds personality. So apart from that, no, I'm perfectly happy. I will leave myself again. I'll leave it over again. What is the most important thing you are focusing on this year? Okay. Okay. So firstly, with regards to this uh, role, the very first thing that I'm focusing on is to successfully finish the Copyright X training course. So we have about 21 um, participants this year. Um, it's a 12 week course that we're teaching. And at the end of that course, then they get a certificate. So I'd like to be able to get at least 100% pass rate for that for this year. And then uh, secondly, I would like to focus, there's a patent drafting course that's been offered for the first time. Um, so I would be very, uh, very pleased if I was part of that. Um, it's an eight-month course being offered by WIPO. I'd be very, very excited if, if, if I could do that because it means that my skills in the patent field um, can be enhanced. And then thirdly, sleep. It's been a year of having a newborn and I don't know, sleep is lacking. I, I wow. need sleep, so I would like to get sleep this year. <laughs> oh, I wish, I wish you more sleep this year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sleep is so like i feel it's so underrated underrated it's yes. so under, but it's so <laughs> yes. important so you don't know you're missing it until you don't have it until like, you, you don't, don't have about it. it until you can't yes it's true that's very very true <laughs> well liz it's been such a wonderful time with you here and it was such a pleasure talking to you thank you so much you're such a lovely interview Elizabeth Oyangi is the Copyright Specialist at Aga Khan University Global East Africa. Thank you for listening to Inspiring Open, a podcast series from Wiki Loves Women. This first series of Inspiring Open was funded through the International Relief Fund for Organizations in Culture and Education 2021, an initiative of the German Federal Foreign Office, the Gothi Institute and other partners, and an annual grant from the Wikimedia Foundation. If you enjoyed today's show, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts so you never miss an episode. Feel free to share, rate, and review us. We appreciate the support. You can also tag us in your posts. We are at Wiki Loves Women on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'll leave you with the words of Ntozake Shange. Sisterhood is important because we are all we have to stand on. We have to stand near and by each other, pray for one another, and share the joys and the difficulties that women face in the world today. If we don't talk about it amongst ourselves, then we are made silent by the patriarchy, and that serves us no purpose. Until next time, look after yourselves and your sisters. And remember, be inspired, be challenged, be bold. I am Betty Kankambwedu, and you've been listening to Wiki Loves Women, Inspiring Open.